Episode 33 with Misha Mansour of Periphery. We talk tour burnout, what it takes to stay inspired and spark joy in one's life, and our insatiable love of Topo Chico bubbly water. Check out his music on the Players Pick podcast playlist on Spotify. Well, w- welcome to the pod, Mish. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, thanks for stopping by, man. What uh, What's good in, in your world? You've been touring quite a bit. Yeah, been touring a lot. A little bit. It's weird. It, we seem to do it in like uh, in like sections because we actually don't tour very much. We take a lot of time off. We maybe do like two or three months a year, but it's all been at once. So where did we go? We went to... Well, we did like part of the States. We've been splitting up our tours now. Mm. Rather than doing the six-week thing, mm-hmm. I think we went to our manager and we're like, yeah, we just don't want to do tours that are like six or seven weeks anymore. Because it's just, I don't know, man. It's, uh, it, you, I, I hate to admit this, but, ooh, sorry. But <laughs> like Topo Chico, bro. Topo Chico, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it, but like you, um, you start to phone it in, or at least I, I do, like by like the fourth or fifth week, and you're just like, wow. "All right, I'm ready to go home." And I don't like that. I don't want to be phoning it in, you know. Of course not. So, I think we found that like splitting it up. So we did, you know, leg one. Uh, what, when was that? September. Mm. Oh my man, my memory's just messed up. September, October, whatever. Yeah, we did one thing, and then. I was home for a couple weeks, and then I went to Japan for some clinics, and then we did the Euro thing, which went very well. That was a cool. lot of fun. I was with uh, with uh, Pliny, an astronaut, um, and yeah, now now I'm I'm back for a little bit. I'm gonna do the whole uh, holiday family thing, and then uh, we got the second leg of the U.S. tour coming up in what February? No, yes, something like that. Whatever. Periphery.net. You yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> that has all the information so that I don't have to. Oh, it makes <laughs> sense. Uh, and you, uh, you've been, uh, I know you noticed you're really into the car thing, obviously. It's pretty yes. obvious anybody's following you. Yes. You've got two <laughs> fairly new sit cars. Yeah, yeah. I, I did I did the whole, uh, I'm doing the whole car thing. It's it's something I'm like still like kind of uh, weird talking about, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm always happy to talk. Cars. But you're doing a good job uh, of like uh, curating cool car content for that, for that audience. It's just, it, it's just genuinely that I just like, I've always loved cars. Like, like the thing is that I've loved cars as long as I can remember. I always tell people the same thing is like my parents got me this Ferrari F40 model, like this red model. Anyone, anyone who doesn't care about cars is going to think this is super boring. Anyone who does <laughs> care about cars will understand the significance of that. Cause it's just, it was just like, oh my God, like, what is this thing? And you know, my five-year-old brain could barely process it. I was like, well, this is what I love now, you know? And probably even before, um, consciously being aware of loving music and whatever, you know, it was just cars, cars, cars growing up, Hmm. but they are expensive. And I, for the majority of my life have not had the means to do a whole lot about it. So I didn't really talk about it a whole lot, uh, uh, but uh, lately, you know, with with all the work and with all the um, the companies and whatever that have been uh, going well, Good. I've been fortunate enough to actually pick up some cars that I like. Uh, and it's literally one of the reasons I work as hard as I do. <laughs> I think if I didn't care about cars or if I didn't have a thing that like I aspired to, I probably would have coasted a long time ago. <laughs> like I don't really need all these endorsements or anything. St- well, no, I mean, story, but- well, you know, I, yeah, I probably, I, I don't know if I would have gotten involved with like, you know, starting companies or things like that. I, I sure. don't know. It's hard to say. Cause then, you know. I mean, you were there when we started uh, Horizon. You're oh, the yeah. reason I have you to thank for for Horizon, <laughs> and it's like that was just that was like I can't believe no one makes this pedal. I just want to buy this pedal, and if no one makes this pedal, then we should just make this pedal, dude. <laughs> and we were like, I mean, we we have you to thank actually, and people don't know this, but we're gonna tell people. Chris <laughs> is the reason that Horizon Devices ever got started, mm. and. Uh, 
ever was able to work with uh, with Dunlop because you were at Dunlop at the time, mm-hmm. and their minimum order was double what we thought we could do, and we were like, yeah. I don't even know. You got it down to an amount that we were like, okay, maybe with like a two month marketing plan, we can <laughs> we can get this going. We like we literally planned for months just to try to get those sold because we were like, yeah, I I don't know if anyone's gonna buy this, or not enough to like sell like the amount that that we needed to make that order, and uh, yeah, like you you basically convinced Jimmy to to do it, and we're like, all right, we'll see what happens. And then, you know, that kind of took off. I, we were not expecting that. I think you believed in us more than we believed in ourselves. Well, dude, uh, I have to agree that, the, that it was a pedal that needed to be made. And the fact that we ended up with the feature set that we did that kind of like took it to the next level with the gate and the whole thing and, and the compact size. Mm-hmm. I was equally invested in wanting to see the pedal go to market, even if just for the, so I could have one. Yeah, right? You know, just so I could have one. But that's the thing. That's the only reason that that company <laughs> exists was because it was like, yeah, like, I can't believe no one makes this, so we should just make it. And then after the fact, we're like, whoa. Because like, I think, you know, that amount, we, we like sold out on pre-orders within like a couple days or something like that. We're like, whoa, I guess people like these <laughs> you know, or people want this. And it didn't even exist yet. Um but uh, yeah, thanks thanks a lot for uh, making that happen because that was uh, someone needed to take a chance on us. You know, we we had been talking to some companies uh, in parallel, and I think a lot of people were very nervous of working with us. And I, I get I get it, but like we kind of needed someone to to throw us a, a bone there, and you totally did. Oh, that's and you my went pleasure. to bat for us, and like that ended up being a really good thing. Um, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, man. But and you're uh, still going strong with Jimmy and the whole crew over there. Oh right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those guys, those guys take really good care of us, and uh, I think they always like they always thought like really highly of you. As a result, they're like, "Oh, you, you're you're the one who brought Horizon to us." Because I don't think any of them were initially like I don't think any of them got it at first. No. And then after the fact, they're like, "Oh, okay, cool. This is like a whole new market, you know?" Right. Um, no, that's great. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know that. I, I wonder if I would have worked as, as hard if I didn't have cars <laughs> well it's good man you have to have goals right like if you don't have a goal to get yourself uh you know motivated then like why do anything right like and yeah. uh so so having a car and a couple of really nice cars that you take pride in and want to like you know keep up and do the whole thing with is a great great goal to like hey well i need to keep writing great music and yeah. and you know creating great gear with other great companies to make it happen. I it's it's just more like I am going to do whatever it takes to make it happen <laughs> because this is the thing is like I don't really care about cars to show off and I don't care about, you know, I don't really tell people uh who aren't car enthusiasts like about my cars or whatever cuz to me they're like especially like the 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 faster ones are like little personal roller coasters. Like that's what I get mm, out of it. Yeah. You know, so I'll go driving on a back road and it's like the feelings that you get from that are pretty much like what you get from a roller coaster. And, and incidentally, I love roller coasters, but like, yeah, if ever I'm having like kind of a bad day or if I'm ever like in a bit of a funk, go for a drive. Mm -hmm. And like, that is a surefire way to put a smile on my face. So I've always loved them and I I still do. And it's something I'm getting into more and more, like kind of like the art of driving and got a sim rig and everything i've gotten really, really nerdy about it. oh yeah like, holy shit a like the, 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 the goal the goal <laughs> the goal for me this is i always like to have like a lofty goal which i don't think i'll ever achieve but i like to have goals right yeah but i'd love to be a what's called a gentleman driver which is where you're not good enough to be a pro driver but you drive with pro drivers and you pay <laughs> it's a whole thing it's a real thing it's like what people will do you have to be very very rich to do that and i'm not very very rich so that's why i say it's a lofty goal which i'll probably never achieve but it's something I'd like to, something I'd like to to do if if possible. Sure. And at at the very least, just do a, a lot of track days and sort of get better at driving because it just makes me very happy. Well, I can identify with the love of cars. I, I my life kind of my early childhood and into I had a similar thing. I was into cars, um, but mostly hot rod stuff. I'm a little older than you, and my both my dad, my stepdad, and my uncle all were like hot rod enthusiasts. Mm. My uncle is like primarily Mopar, Dodge, and like had all the like challengers and wow. chargers and uh road runners and stuff like that and a couple of Ford trucks and and then my uh my my real dad had uh Chevelles, uh 66 Chevelles, 70 67 Chevelles. 
Uh, my first car was a 67 Chevelle with a 327. Oh, man. And so, like, I, I rebuilt a motor in an auto shop and, like, before I could even drive. I didn't know that. So you're, like, yeah. legitimately into, yeah, you're just in the hot rod scene. Yeah, I just, it, it was a different era. And, like, I learned all about compression, all about intake manifolds and all carburation systems not fuel right, injection right, systems right, right, right you know and i know just enough about like oh well that replaces this and and i was funny though is I, I spent all this time like burning out getting tickets and like doing small town fucking backwoods shit <laughs> <laughs> get i had so many tickets before i was 18 like they they warned me so you're gonna get your license like suspended <laughs> you know because because it was like what we did in a small town is like try to like work in your car go out and like run the quarter mile outside of town that's what happens when you give a car like that to a 16 <laughs> or 17 year like what do you expect yeah, you know they, well and, and what was you worse drive it conservatively <laughs> no no what was worse is my dad was so proud that I was taking such an interest in cars that when I was 13, he taught me how to drive. I could drive the 66 Chevelle with no power steering at oh, 13. Wow. I knew how to like, you know, uh, not oversteer, work through the different things on a, on a gravel road. He'd take me out in the back roads and like... And those like, cars are a handful, man. Oh, it's man. not like today's cars. All rear wheel, you know, and yeah. you get real heavy. You have to kind of know how they shift on the, on the gravel and whatnot. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So he's kind of helped me like... Lose control so that I could gain control, and that's awesome. All that stuff, you know, learn the basics of uh, suspension and the. Uh, but what happened to me was that then, then my license came, and I was like, okay, now I'm gonna drive the shit out of this car. But before, I mean, before that, I was let me back up. I loved cars so much that I would steal the car. Oh, really? I would at night. My parents would go to sleep. I had I had extra keys made, or I would go and snag their keys when they're asleep. Sneak out the back window with my little brother. He was fourteen, or no, he was two years. He's two years younger than me, so that means like when, when I was fourteen, he was barely twelve, dude. We were out driving around. Jesus, and like, I mean, is this is this podcast confessions right yeah, now? Yes. Wow, look at that! I had no idea. Yeah, that's what was up, man. Um, this is a side of you that anyone who knows Chris would probably be just. A, I know you as the yoga guy, yeah, the mindfulness, zen, calm. Calm in a Shit. storm, yoga guy. This is a this. I don't know this, Chris. This well, is interesting. It's part. It's just something you get. You know. You, yeah. You get a little that little something out here and there. You know. And uh, I mean, this is like this is growing up. This is formational, Chris. Of course. I, so I'm also I'm also identified with like being a big Pantera fan during my early years too. So like yeah. I was in a metal band and like I was mad at my dad. I was mad at everybody. You know. So I wanted to have a metal band too, just like you. Yeah. You know. And uh, I don't know if you're mad at your dad the same way I was mad at my dad, but. You know, no, uh, no, I don't think that's why I wanted to get into metal. I never, I never was angry. You know, that's uh, really that's fine. No, no, no. I just thought heavy music was the best, like especially. And you know what? It's not even that heavy music is necessarily my favorite, but it's my favorite live. Mm. Like live, yeah. like like metal live is just an experience. It's like this visceral experience and the energy is completely palpable like it's mm. a real thing that you feel when you're there true and i remember just going to those kinds of shows and be like i want to be on that stage making those people move like that totally like i felt for other styles of music like obviously like bigger styles of music with with, with bigger crowds you know you'd see there's, there's still energy there you know people are um are singing along and whatever dude like mosh pits and crowd surfing and circle pits and you know just it was just like there is something happening here and i want to be a part of that and that that is i think what inspired me so it's interesting you say the anger because actually that's the one thing i never really felt like i never actually think i was trying to say anything with my music hmm. and and i've had discussions with this about nolly i've talked about this before because nolly was like you know um Maybe it's even the difference between like someone like me and someone like Spencer, our singer. Mm -hmm. Spencer writes very emotionally, like every, and of course he would. Most lyricists sure. do. They're writing about something. Yeah. I, I never really gave much thought to what I was writing about, and then I also realized that I couldn't really write about something in a in a traditional sense. I know some people will use music as as therapy, like it's some sort of therapeutic way to work through some some stuff you're going through. And like my relationship with music has never been like that, or if it has been like that, it's uh, it's definitely uh, subconscious. Okay. It's not something where I'm like consciously working through some issues uh, at all. And, and 
And like I, I think as a result, I usually write when I'm happy. You know, I don't write when I'm when I'm when I'm sad. I just don't do anything when I'm sad. That's awesome, actually. That's like uh, you're like a reverse artist. It's person, a reverse artist. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just something I enjoy doing. Like I just enjoy and like the sound of something that's heavy just puts a smile on my face. You know. Yeah. So I actually, I would say I would say like it was just more about like feeling joy from music rather than working out anger. You know. Well, I feel that way now about it. Yeah. Like I feel I I've gotten to that place now like when I but it's also interesting that all these years later that uh I I'm I'm less drawn to the heavy stuff as I was because yeah. I, cause I'm less angry. Like I, and that's because I identified like Pantera I remember the first couple times I heard Pantera and my, a buddy of mine put it in and I was just like this is I'm so fucking mad this is my <laughs> fucking band. I, I mean, mean that's a that's an ang- that's some angry music. You yeah, know? fucking hostile, man. Like, right. It just I was like, yes, it just flipped the switch, and I was like, this might be how I exercise those demons. Yeah, you know, is through listening to this, and then I, I I barely even play guitar at the point, and uh, but like going up, I rem- I just remember as I started to learn more about trying to make the sounds that the guitar could make, I wanted to sound more and more like Pantera and you know surrounding yeah. bands Testament and anything else. Was yeah, out at the time, but. Thankfully, I'm not as angry, and uh, and I and I and I, I write and create from a happy place more so now than ever. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. You say it's good. I don't know. I've always envied the people who 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 uh, write emotionally. You know, I because really? yeah, because well, maybe it's just the way my brain works. But I always you know want the thing I can't have. Right, right. right. Uh, so um, it's uh, and, and and the way I write is just the way I write. It's just it's nothing that special to me. It's just how it is. Right. So it just seems so interesting to be able to work through stuff. Or it'd be nice. You know, I uh, I used to notice, like, patterns. Like, uh, I get affected a lot by the weather. So I noticed, like, when I was uh, when I was living in Washington, D.C., and we get, like, you know, brutal winters or whatever, just cold winters. I didn't want to go outside or whatever. Sure. I wouldn't write any music. And if we went on vacation somewhere sun- sunny and I brought a rig, I would actually start writing again. <laughs> and I'd tend to write better in the summer when the weather was better. So I, I'd, I'd notice these patterns. And it would almost be better to not be, like, Reliant on such arbitrary stuff. I guess emotions are also arbitrary in a way, but it would just be nice to not be kind of tethered to those things. Uh, and to also like be able to use it sort of directly as therapy for, for something or work out through something, which I know a lot of people do. Well, um, you, I mean, you say that you write from a, a, in a, in a happier place. That is an emotion too. So yeah. it's like when things are good, like that's a good... And if that's where your, your sweet spot is, that's cool. Some people's sweet spot is when things aren't so good. That's yeah. all. I yeah, think, I guess you're right. I guess you know. you're right. It's just it's just more like I don't have any emotional attachment mm. to or, or not traditionally. It's just like it's aesthetically. So this is why I discussed with Nolly is like, you know, people write emotionally or people write aesthetically. I write aesthetically. Like I just want it to sound cool. Mm-hmm. I want to I I want to be moved in a way where I'm just like this sounds awesome or like I I nailed it, you know, or or this is this is the the idea I had in my head and this is it coming to life. So it's kind of that, that's what I'm getting out of it rather than, because I notice, I notice that people who write emotionally tend to care less. Sometimes I don't want to generalize, but sometimes care a little bit less about the aesthetics Mm. because for them, it's more like I'm working this thing out and who cares, Mm. you know, like who cares about the aesthetics of that? It's like, I've worked it out. Like that's the important stuff is done. And Mm. I'm kind of like, how are you not hearing this or hearing that? And they're like, no, like emotionally I've gotten kind of gotten what I needed to get out. Uh, and then for for me, like that was kind of not having empathy to that side, you know. So I've I've been trying to like at least appreciate that side of it. Right. So bit. I hear what you're saying. So like the, the emotional side is represents because they're ha- they have something to say. Yep. And it's very very interesting. It's more important to say that something, right? Uh, so that they can therapeutically let go of it and and live, you know, release it versus like trying to create something perfect. Right. And and then no, that's exactly right. Okay. And then and then because to them it's like no, that I've achieved my goal. Why do you care if like we could like make this a little bit cleaner or whatever, you know? Sure. And I'm like, oh, but it could be so much heavier. It could be it could sound so much better. Mm-hmm. It's just like kind of looking at it a different way. And then um, yeah, like I, I I used to think that like maybe it was just lyrics or people who write lyrics that write emotionally because that is obviously a a, a direct co- connection. Sure, but. Then I've also uh, talked to people who write instrumentally and have like a whole story or a whole thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's limited just to, I, I think it's just the way my, my, my brain works. So I'm envious of people who write uh, emotionally. Interesting. Well, it's inter- Also, I'm thinking because you say the, the instrumental thing, I, it makes me think of 
classical classical composers that uh, had full on stories that accompanied the the suites and the 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 different movements of sure. these classical pieces, and there was zero lyrics involved. In right, that, you know, like uh, so, it's not surprising, you know, that there's there's that way of of being it. It's just like. It's less direct, as you say. Like yeah. it, somebody that's writing vocals, or a singer songwriter, or a vocalist, obviously has a very direct w- way of uh, being emotional or expressing emotion, ba- because of the human voice. Uh, but uh, how many? I mean, you are moved by emotional players probably all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, I definitely appreciate it. You know, um, like okay, you got your Devin tattoo. Like yeah. Devin, Devin's a great example. I feel like that dude's like worked his entire. He's probably like saved like. Well, he's probably still in therapy, but he's probably saved a lot of <laughs> in therapy just from doing the music, you know? Sure. Uh, and you can hear it. Like, listening to Alien, mm, that's an angry fuck. album. I love that album, but you can feel the anger. Like, uh, like Shitstorm, like, oh, holy dude. shit, that's one of the angriest songs I've ever heard. Yeah. I love it. But So I can appreciate it, but I can't necessarily uh, conjure that for myself. And talking about Devin, I think it's something that also he ties to into in, in a very genuine way, which is why he had trouble writing heavy music or he felt like the heavy stuff he write, wrote was a bit contrived or whatever. Cause he was like, this is not, you know, he was writing heavy to be angry and, and right. he's not angry anymore. And he was like, well, this doesn't necessarily sound right. You know, this isn't really, I think he's that kind of that perfect mix of, of emotional writing and aesthetic writing. Cause you can tell mm-hmm. he really, really cares about both sides. But that's why he's got his vision is so precise. You guys yeah. share the 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 writer producer roles too, though. So like like you guys have, like he he has that he's a writer, but he's also the the golden ear guy too. Right, right. Whereas, uh, um, which I mean, you have that too. You're a writer and the golden ear guy that's listening and. But it is producing. just aesthetic, and I've had to like open myself up to a little bit of like imperfection or whatever on on Spencer's part mm. because you know he's not always. He'll he'll have a take which I'll be like you know oh like maybe we could do that better but he feels like he's captured what he's wanted to to capture with that and mm-hmm. I've I've learned that that's like very important you sure. know because I might be viewing it as perfectly aesthetic or there was a better take that was aesthetically hitting it and he was just like no this is the one that I felt this is the one where I felt right and that like that's internal that's something that's just important to him so kind of having empathy for that and recognizing that. It's part of like what helps us work together hmm. work better which we've uh which we've definitely gotten the hang of like over the last few albums which it's is cool nice. yeah i actually not too long ago r- watched your um uh the the making of p4 mm. that you guys put up that yeah was super yeah, yeah. cool oh, uh and it was really cool what one of my favorite parts of watching that was it was Jake or Mark, I don't know, talking about how uh, how it's like the hot seat scenario where where like it's all in a room and you're working on an idea and then it's like whoever is kind of vibing off of the thing gets kind of put in the hot seat and then the, like okay like flesh that out and like everybody yeah. else will kind of help you, yeah. you know, tell you hey th- that sounds good or whatever and I I really like that and that, and I remember you mentioning something about how important it is to have. Uh, these guys, uh, it, just having a band and, and, and being able to trust them in the way that you do to, yes. to, to, to figure out, like, is this cool? Like, I can't tell you like how, <laughs> how much of a difference that makes. And I think the evidence right there is the, in the fact that like, I mean, I could have put out a solo. I was thinking about this actually, as I was getting ready today, I was like, you know, should I work on a solo album? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Like I've, I've put out side projects with both Mark and Jake before mm-hmm. doing a solo album. There is something that like when, but, but this is not just with anyone. It's with people you trust, you know, right. and I trust those guys. Um, and I trust the band in a way where that is no longer an issue. It's something that's taken like a decade to get the hang of. Right. And we're still ironing it, ironing it out. But, but it's at a point where there's real comfort when we're, when we're writing music around each other and to just have someone even say no to you. Mm. like that just saves hours of second guessing right oh my god you can just have someone be like nah you know and and i know that there's nothing behind it you know or the the trust is also on my end that's not like oh you know this is him getting me back for saying no to his thing (laughs) earlier or whatever it's like no i know that everyone's eye is on the prize and 
I'm in the middle of it. I'm usually the one heading up the session and I'm usually kind of producing the writing sessions. Mm -hmm. So I'm really close to everything. And I'm thinking about everything like very, very up close and thinking about a lot of different things. And those guys are in the back and they're listening to it happen and they have a completely different perspective. And that is one of the most useful things to be able to tap into, which I can't just tap in. I can't just like take a step back. But they are in that step back and they're listening to it like as it's happening. And to be able to go to those guys and then they'll be like, yeah, no, I like that. Or nah, that's not right, you know, mm -hmm. or mm, not feeling this idea at all. Because of the trust, now there's no bitterness. It's like, okay, great. Like, okay, this is not good. Let's stop wasting time on this. Let's come back to it later or just ditch it all together. Mm. And it just makes the process so quick. And it means that you don't have this stress. It's not a stressful session. It's just like, okay, cool. On to the next thing. Okay, we're feeling this. Great, because I'm feeling this too. We're on to something. Mm. And, and then, you know, getting Spencer involved and he's approaching it from the vocal standpoint and we're starting to arrange it together and Matt's coming in and he's got ideas on all ends. It's just like we found our way of, of making it work to where everyone's input is extremely useful and makes the whole process very simple. You know, it's a, it's something that we can just rely on and we know there's no ulterior motive. We know that everyone's eyes yeah. on the prize for that. So I feel very, very fortunate to have found a group of people I can do that with. But then once you're exposed to that, writing by yourself can be really stressful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and that's, I've experienced, I experienced exactly that being in a band for eight years working with a, a tight group of people, mainly a drummer and a bass player that I really uh, it, uh, appreciated their feedback because right. I come in with something like, yeah, no. Yeah, like, and you know not to take else. it personally. You know, like, yeah. no, they're just really looking at it for what it is. At first I did, though. Like, in the beginning, yeah. that was going to be one of my my questions to you is, do, do you remember when it stopped being a personal thing when, oh, when yeah. you guys sorted it out? How long ago was that? I mean, it, it's not. it wasn't like a single day i'd say so so here's the problem is that the first album was basically my solo album okay you know i mean jake and i wrote race car together but other than that it's all stuff i basically wrote by myself and then i was heavily involved with all the the vocal writing and um spencer came in at the the 11th hour to basically retrack everything and maybe contribute a couple of things but it was basically my project right and everyone accepted that but that's not what i wanted i wanted to be in a band and I made that very clear. So as of Periphery 2, we started to be more collaborative. But then I started to realize what that means giving up. Mm. And also that's where these things, you know, there started to be this kind of tension about that. Like in these fights, like sort of back and forth and people taking things personally when their stuff was cut. It's like, no, like this is not personal. And it took a lot of conversations. It took a lot of time. And, and I'd say starting with Juggernaut, which is the album after that, that's the first time where the collaboration started to feel a bit more natural and it felt like we could talk a bit more openly and not have to like tiptoe around each other's feelings. Mm -hmm. um, but even still, there was still a little bit of tension. You know, it's, it's a gradual process. And I think Periphery 3 was the first time where we felt really comfortable in our own skin, you know? Nice. So, what's that, seven or eight years at that point, you know, maybe longer? Yeah. Took a, it, takes, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Well, and that's... There's, that's the case with all relationships. Right. Like the long, you know, you get to, you have to get to breaking points where you have to really question each other's motives. Yep. And really dig past it and try to get people to expose themselves a little bit more. And, and, uh, I mean, you know, that in, in, in romantic relationships and friendships, just outside of a band environment, that can happen. And honestly, a lot of the better relationships do have to go through that process. Yeah. Yeah. To get to the, the level where you have, like, oh, dude, I trust that person. Like, I know it's, their it's exactly the same, though. It's interesting yeah. you bring that up because it is exactly the same, just with more people. So it makes it that much more <laughs> right. volatile, if you will. But the, the, the thing is that there are either people who want to work on it, who see that, 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 the relationship that you have is worth more than the sum of its parts. And therefore it's worth working on yourself. And um, the things that are being identified are things that are worth working on. And, you know, I'm not saying this from any position uh, of authority on this or, or, or anything where I'm special because I've been talked to about my behavior and my, you know, everyone's had this talk. Everyone's <laughs> had to work on themselves. Um, and it's all, you know, there's one or uh, there's one of two ways you can really respond to that. One is just like, fuck you, I'm out. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, damn, that sucks. You know, I'm making people I care about bummed out or I'm not handling this thing well. How can I work on it? Um, mm. And 
you know, we're, we're human. So it takes time. It's not like the next day it's like, Oh, we're, we're good to go. But I know at least for me, like if I've had a conversation with someone about something that's going on and just see that they're making an effort, even if they mess up, like it's fine. At least I see they care. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with relationships, same thing with friends, same thing with everything. You just want to see that people care enough to sort of keep the relationship afloat. And it's less about what you're personally getting out of it. Mm. You know, less of a selfish approach. And it's more like, okay, what do we do to work together to keep this thing afloat and keep it growing? And I found that, that all those conversations and all those breaking points or potential breaking points that you're talking about mm -hmm. have all, as a result, at least with, with our current BAM members, brought us closer. Awesome. You know, seeing, seeing the way. And that's where I think we're really lucky, you know? Yeah. Um, because we have, we have a group of people that are introspective that do have the, the, the band as, as the priority and not their individual feelings. And that's, that's why over the course of however many years we can kind of trust each other. And then it doesn't even enter the conversation. You know, it's, I, I could have worked on a part for hours just following a thread, you know, just seeing where it goes. And if the rest of the guys are like, eh, you know, I'm like, okay, you know what? They're, they're hearing, they're hearing something. I'm not, or there've been parts where I'm like, I don't really get this. I don't get why, why this is good or whatever. And literally everyone else is like, no, that's sick. And I'm like, okay, so it's, it's just me. Mm. And I'm obviously missing something here and I'm not, you know, the arbiter of what's, mm -hmm. of what's right and wrong here. So, so let's just go with the guys, you know? That's awesome. Um, and, and to be able to trust guys like that is a real gift. It really, uh, it speaks to this kind of ongoing theory that I'm putting together. It's like not my theory, but it's just the, the concept that relationship is the central tenet in life that uh, allows one to actually become uh, one's best self uh, through through the reflection, through the the opening up and saying, okay, like what about you know what about my how am I landing on this person? Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 is my effect on them? Yeah. And, and vice versa. And through that uh, constant bounce of uh, of ideas and um, and perspectives, we 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 find out a uh, what we actually believe in or what we actually favor through that process because oftentimes in a vac or you know in a, in a, in a in a solitude kind of vacuum scenario we can get away with so much on our own we can we can we can justify all these things these life choices all and, but then you have a girl come in or, or a significant other right and she all of a sudden says, you know, I don't like the way you, you got to pick your shit up. I don't want, right. you know, don't do that. Like, wait, why do you say that when we go to the thing? You know, and you, you're like, ah, oh, fuck, you could, you're left with all these opportunities to say, fuck this. You can't tell me what to do. Yeah. Right. But, 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 the, but the relationship uh, it tends to be greater than the sum of its parts. Ultimately, if you can have that vision, you can see that the, that the goal is actually uh, unification and, and, and harmony in, in, with, with each other that, that you end up doing the small things that make a difference to other people, and it starts to feel good that you like you listen, you stop and listen to the person. Absolutely, though I would add a little caveat, which yeah. is you need listen. to surround yourself with people that, in my opinion, are better than you, and people that you trust and respect, because sure. that could also be a very negative thing if you're around a, a let's call it a poisonous crowd or a totally. negative crowd. That can be infectious as well, sometimes more infectious, and can kind of turn you. Uh, into a lesser person, a lesser I can see version that. of yourself. So, so it's it's also about sort of choosing your uh, your company carefully, which uh, which I like to do. As I say, I don't have a lot of friends, but the ones I do, I, I hold very close. Um, and and I think I think that, that that's a big part of it. But it's the reason why I pretty much exclusively want to be friends with, uh, you know, really close with and uh, try to surround myself with people that I admire to some degree because sure. there's something to, to, to take from it. And yeah, seeing how I land, seeing how I land with someone I don't really care about or someone I think is an asshole, it's like whatever, right? Mm -hmm. but, if I, but if I admire them, I care about them and I've done something to slight them or so, done something to offend them, that actually not only hurts me, but like makes me look at like, okay, so where am I messing up? What, what did I do wrong? What did, what did I miss here, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the things that I've been working on or trying to improve about myself have been from moments like that, like sort of negatively affecting people I admire. Hmm. Um, so... I don't know. Maybe that's my justification for for why I keep my my close circle. But um. well, it's all opportunities. I think what what I'm I, I hear all that, and I think the opportunity uh, when somebody raises something, it's an opportunity for uh, you to wake up. Like uh, there's all these aspects of uh, our vision. Um, 
Like we're very narrow minded people. Like ultimately humans are, we only have a very limited scope of focus mm-hmm. it, to begin with. And then, uh, so there's, there's all this like unconscious slash subconscious slash, you know, like just hidden ignorance, uh, aspects of us. So it takes the reflection. Somebody actually has to hold the mirror up and say, are you sure this, are you sure this? Is this right. really what you want? Right. Sometimes it takes okay. that rude awakening, right? Yeah. And it's and if if we start to see it as opportunities to to w- awaken, to just grow and just like wake up to maybe these parts that have been lying dormant or we just like bypass them for so long that it's just become the normal thing and somebody says, "Oh, you know, it'd just be cooler if you just asked me." You right. know, for about, about instead of just taking my 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 food out of the fridge, you know, right. just stupid, like, oh yeah, well then, hey, is it cool if I get some of your Topo Chico? <laughs> yeah, man, I got an extra one. Speaking yours. of which, this uh, podcast is um, brought to you, brought to you by Topo Chico. <laughs> Not really, but I wish it was, and I wish my band was brought to you by Topo Chico. Topo we should Chico. we should uh, digress uh, very quickly to talk about Topo Chico because I came out here. To do this podcast, and you asked me if I wanted bubbly water, to which the answer is always yes. <laughs> but then you surprised me with Topo Chico, which is the superior, it is the best. We were talking about the hierarchy of, of bubbly water, which I didn't realize there was, but there is. Uh, and at least in America. Let's mm. go, let's just stick with America in case, you know, our international viewers in, uh, or listeners in Germany get yeah. offended. because yeah, they, they might. They, they, they might. But in America, Topo Chico is at the top of that hierarchy, no question. Agreed. Um, and uh, it should be uh, more readily available everywhere. And I hope Topo Chico listens to this and endorses Periphery. Gives us uh, all the bubbly water that we can handle. Hashtag that. Topo Chico. Going to be tagged in this goes live so that uh, Misha can get his Topo yeah. Chico. Yeah, H- hashtag spicy water. Spicy water. The way I like it. Anyways, we can we can go back and talk <laughs> about uh, actually important things now. No, it's good. Uh, it's good. We, we got to take a commercial break every now and again. Oh, right? there, there we go. Yeah. A, what, I'm not getting it, paid for would this. It be, but... Would it be a podcast if we didn't take a commercial break? <laughs> it, you know? it just wouldn't be. No, um, well, it's... You know what uh, the the podcast is about is picks, and um, you know we've done a few picks together throughout the years. Yeah, we have. Actually. Did you bring some? I did. Oh, sweet. So, I, what oh, are you on uh, now? You still on the T so, threes, or what are you? Uh, no. No, 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 I'm not. No, you no look, T3s, you look no? disappointed. No, no, it's fine. So, I'm, I'm so on. I'm, I'm, I, you can tell me what you think of this. So, so obviously you remember this one. This is the T yeah. three, which yeah. I think this we is settled a, on sixty, right? I think I think that's the sixty. Yeah, and. Um, for all the conspiracy theorists out there, I swear to God, the white material is more flexible than the black material. I believe it. Um, so, so actually, like I'm, I'm partial. I don't know if the other colors are the same, but I feel like the black ones have slightly less flex in general, or maybe with the Tortex. Um, and got an orange one right here. You can yeah, test those two out. I mean, yeah, it's pretty, pretty close. Pretty, pretty close. Actually, yes, I think so. Maybe, maybe is maybe different colors have different flex, and the black seems to be this the 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 least flexy, the stiffest, the stiffest. Okay. Of, that's the word. Oh, am I am I looking <laughs> at an orange flow over there? Is that so what you so got? so? Check this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, yeah. It, so it's just corresponding to the color. Yeah, it's a sixty then. Yeah. Um. So Jake was the one who turned me on to this. Um. Because Jake was. Was it Jake or was it Mark? No, no, it was Jake. One of those guys. I forget who. I think it was Jake. Was was messing with these, and I was out of picks, um, and uh, and I just started stealing his. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, 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 grab it. So I was playing. I think I was playing Jake Bowen signature picks, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, and I was and I was really feeling them. Um, I I, I like the shape of these a lot. Um, so they're they're like they're they're you know. The untrained eye, they're not that different um, than the than the T3s, but they're a little bit smaller. I just like the shape of these a lot. A little bit smaller, but the end, it's that, that wide breadth right there. Right. So instead of going down the, the, the kind of symmetrical or the, uh, not symmetrical, but going down in, in, the, in the same graduation as a Jazz 3 pick, like right. the T3 does. It's like a, it's like almost. Is it bigger than an XL? I think it's slightly bigger. Slightly than Slightly bigger than the XL. Yeah. yeah, or a brown. I have an XL somewhere. Because the XL was the pick I it's almost loved, there. but there was something that wasn't quite right. And then this one was the one where it was like my set went very well with this mm. to the point where like I don't really play with these anymore. The T3s, the, the with with those anymore. So now I'm all on these. Um, so they're flow. It's the same material, right? Yeah. So same materials. Tortex. It's a it's a sheet, 
uh, material that's stamped. So, so these shapes are stamped out of a sheet. Yeah. And then uh, and then and then tumbled. And I'm not finding a Jazz 3XL. It's around here somewhere. Yeah, but we got to compare because I'm actually com- I'm a actually regular curious. Jazz. Um, I've seen that in a while. <laughs> but but I do have one complaint. I do have one complaint, which that? is that the the tip wears out very very quickly on. Yeah, this. on the thinner the thinner picks, it's going to do that. Yeah, and I want to figure out a way to not have that happen. I don't know if switching to Alt doing like an Altex version of this would so fix that or Alt-M, not. Altem um, sixty is. It can be done. It's pretty. It's pretty thin for Ultem because it it's more brittle. Mm-hmm. It, it, it has. It's e- easier to snap. So snap rather than than sort of wear. Potential out. for it, but um, if you're not putting a grip in it, you're not really. You don't seem to be much of a grip guy. You've never. No, really no, I don't. I don't do like that. grips on the pick. So I know that Dunlop still does a sixty uh, like standard. Uh, is it maybe as an Ultex standard and probably a? Oh, there's a. That's a cool uh, Paul Gilbert pick. Ooh. It's a it's an Ibanez pick actually, but um, oh wow, he uses Tortex on his drill, but <laughs> but, he uses, but he uses this. Uh, That's interesting. Here, it's hang, a, it's hang, an interesting shape. Hang out for a second. I'll get a Jazz Three XL. Yes. Um, are your are your uh, your uh, branded players picks the the flow? Those are flow seventy three on the black and one point. So everyone is all about the flow. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think they're. I think they're. I think it's an awesome pick. I really, really do. And I wasn't really expecting to like it, but, but I really do. Let's see. Jesus. Ooh. Let's see if I could do a fifty. Yeah, the fifty could be interesting. See, so I like I like picks with a lot of flex. I think a lot of people are surprised, but it's because I pick so hard that like. Um, I can it allow me to pick hard, get the attack I want, and not make my guitar go out of tune or, you know, snap a string. So I used to use Jazz 3's live and I was like, why am I always why am I always breaking strings, you know? Um so that's a regular size too. Yeah, that's regular there. For all the picks, I'm almost disappointed now. <laughs> I know that's so many picks. I've got um Probably got some XLs around here somewhere. I just don't know where the hell they're at at the moment. That's not a big deal. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as I stop looking, you know. It'll remain oh, a wait, mystery. Here. Duh. Uh, no, no. You know what? Uh, well, I know where I was. There's one right here because there's uh, Animals Leaders. There's the uh, XL. Oh, really? And this is Altex, right? Yeah, that's the Altan. Altex. Altex, Altan, whatever. And this is a 73. So that's a Jazz 3 XL. So the the yeah the the real estate is really close. It is very close, but the way that this one sort of comes out, it's a bit rounder there. Yeah, I, I like that. And <laughs> and I also because I think it's because I angled my pick a little bit, so the way it hits the string is a little bit nicer. Mm-hmm. And yeah, maybe I should see if they could do a flow, sixty millimeters, all ten, all text, whatever. All text, yeah. Um, they might yeah they might, they might be able to do uh, yeah one of the the regular ones without. Uh, It'd be a new mold. It'd be interesting. I have to ask. I wish I could ask you to do that. I well, can't. I, you can. Can I? I, I, I can? talk to Jimmy all the time. Okay, good. I'll just ask you to do that because yeah. you because you always went into like this insane detail with the with the picks, which I loved. It made my life very easy. It's super so, fun. Yeah, it that's, is. That's that's why the podcast is here too. It's yeah. why it's because it's like one of the things that I did a lot of at Dunlop. Yeah. And uh, and I'm still passing stuff over to Tim over there. You yeah. Know? And uh, and Brian Kehoe and and Daryl. All those guys uh, still work over there uh, full time. I get to uh, have the benefit of of uh, be having a great relationship with Dunlop, but I don't have to go to the office. You, you're you're in my office, so yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> right? No, you're you're working from home, which is the the smart thing to do, especially out here, right? Yeah, yeah. oh man, <laughs> it's so much nicer. Um, and so I mean that the the pick conversation, I, I always like to ask, like, what do you remember where you started? What were your first couple of guitar picks? Um. So so I I know I know that they were probably so I was a drummer when I started. Oh really? Yeah, I started out on drums. I always wanted to be a drummer. That was my first instrument. Wow. And one of the passive benefits anyone who was like had band, band practice as a drummer knows you probably practice at your place cuz you know the drums are the most inconvenient. Oh yeah. So while I was annoying my uh my parents uh with band practice at at home 
the guitarist was, you know, bringing uh, his gear over. People were bringing their gear over. Uh, and um, that's where I was just kind of jamming on stuff because they didn't, they're they like, oh, I'll just leave it here. I'll be, I'll be here next week. I'll just leave it here. So I'd always have like guitar rigs and guitars. <laughs> that's how I first started playing on a seven string. Wow. Um, Somebody this, just left one at your house? Yeah, it was this guy, uh, Alex Wiglicky, uh, Wiglicky, that we went, you know, we went to high school. We were friends and we, we had our quote unquote band, which was not a band. Sure. It was just us jamming together. But you had a band name probably. Oh man, what I don't it? even know if we had a band name. I think um, was that Scaver? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's the only thing was, I want to know. Which which your first couple of band names that you well, that was, came up with? You see, after that there were no bands, and it was just like Bulb. After that, that was the oh, name really? of the band was Bulb in in Toronto. Yeah, I didn't have like a serious band in high school, but you know, I had I had people who came over and, and played, uh, but they'd leave gear there. It was great, and this guy Alex would always leave his uh, his amps there, and he left like a little four track recorder, you know, like it was all this stuff that was great. It kind of gave me stuff to play around with, and I'd play around on the guitars. So I was probably using whatever picks he left there. Mm, okay. I, I don't I don't remember. It was just miscellaneous, let's just say. Um, What's the first one you remember picking? What pick? you know what? Where were there those like? Like see through, like was that was that a Jim Dunlop pick? Could it had like different 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 writing, and it had like um, it was just like it would been it would have been like see through yellow or see through red, like completely like clear. Yeah, yeah uh, you I don't know have, what I'm talking about. I don't about? have any of the gels right here right now, but like they 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 have transparent purple, red, yellow, green. And it says like it says Jim Dunlop, but it's in like, it's a, like a, a different weird, font. Yeah, weird font. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Those I remember for sure. Okay. And I'm not just saying that because it's Dunlop. I'm actually I was actually expecting it not to be a, a Dunlop pick, but that's that's one that I remember. I remember those because you know they're kind of bright. They kind of stand yeah. out. Um, and then there was a uh, uh, there was another guitarist I, I played with who who had jazz threes, and I was like, whoa. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, this is the this is the Petrucci pick, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, that's the secret, you know? Yeah. So that was a little bit later. Um, but yeah, that's how how I was introduced. And I I remember uh, when I when I first started, I was really not picky about picks. Like I just didn't care. But I also had really terrible technique then. <laughs> um, it's slightly better now, but um, but back then I just also I just didn't really care about guitar that much. It was like kind of a thing to do when I couldn't play drums. But um, but yeah, the 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 goal back then was to be a drummer. Wow. Um, so, so yeah, it was just, it was just whatever was around basically. That's cool though. I, I can imagine I, a, a lot of, a handful of really great guitar players actually started off in percussion. I mean like Al Miola is one of the guys mm-hmm. like that is notorious for that. Like he was percussionist and then got into the thing. And, uh, um, I don't know, but I, I wonder about that for you as far as like, does that, it must translate to you being able to, uh, produce and uh write drums in the box yeah really well. I, I mean it doesn't it doesn't hurt i wouldn't i would say that you know you don't have to play drums to like for example nolly doesn't really play drums but he programs them fantastically mm. and i know a lot of people who don't really play drums but can program like super realistic and, and great sounding uh drum parts but it definitely helps um sure. and uh what one tip i've always told people this is like whenever i write guitar riffs or whatever i've always got like at least one drum beat kind of playing in my head while i'm I'm doing it i've Mm. always got a beat in mind um and the beauty of being able to program is that you know if you have other ideas or if you want to experiment with it on the spot you can but Mm -hmm. um so i'll usually spend some time playing around with that because it can drastically affect the feel um but kind of understanding how drums can uh, you know how you could get like three riffs out of a riff, like just by changing the drum part, you know, right. and the and the context and the feel of it, right? Um, it's a super powerful tool, and it's a. It, it, there's a lot of people I think who write really really sick riffs and aren't thinking about that, and all you have to do is just start thinking about that. Really, just kind of try to hear what the drums would be playing and and think about that. Think about and that'll help you arrange. I'll help you get a flow of the song because the drums also need to flow in a way that that makes sense. Shifting the way the drums evolve underneath the same riff is mm-hmm. kind of what you're speaking to, and or or even or in the context of the song, like you don't maybe you do want the the feel to be the same for the whole song, but maybe you don't. Maybe that's where you get the ebb and flow and the energy. Yeah, you know, um, you 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 have like a 
uh, like a, a double time verse and it's very energetic and then like it opens up on the chorus with a half time, you know, mm-hmm. or you have something that's more frenetic for the verses and then, yeah, you can, you could just, you could just play around with it and, and completely change the context of the song uh, using drums. So I've always th- thought of the two as very intertwined. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I think that's always helped with, um, with uh, um, writing and arranging. And then, you know, if, if ever I'm stuck, sometimes I'll just have like, a drum loop from somewhere else in the song, you know, just kind of put that over and just jam over that. See what comes to mind. You know, it's a, it's just, a, it's just a useful, it's a useful writing, writing tool. And, and I think, it, I think every guitarist should be you know, who's serious about sort of writing songs, like should be thinking about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea of too. Like if, if you've even used a drum beat for one thing and then uh, you're kind of like looking for other answers or ways to complete that song, to use that same, to, use that same drum beat to like potentially give you ideas for a different hundred percent thing. Right. could be a similar tempo, could be whatever. And it just, you can just evolve that. And it still like has some continuity yep. in, in the whole thing by utilizing uh, another piece, but kind of like remixing it. I always say like, I want my songs to exist in the same world, mm. you know? So, so I, I've seen a lot of songs are riff salads and it's like, you know, these really cool parts, but, why is this in this song and not in something else? I want things that tie it together. So motifs are a very useful tool. Sure. And and this is basically creating a, a drum motif, right? Mm-hmm. So even if the riff is, there's going to be something familiar about it. And there's something that you could build off because, you know, as long as, as, long as you're not just playing random stuff over the drums, if you're, playing, if you're playing around with those drums, you know, and it's from another part of the song, now you're taking something that has a certain feel um, and you're you're writing a part that sounds very different, but it's still tied to the rest of it. It makes sense that that's in that song. So yeah, these are little hacks to like kind of get around uh, not knowing what the next section should be. Or it doesn't always work, but it's worth a shot, right? Yeah, it's one way to get in. You know, to get into the mood, to get into the mode. Absolutely, move forward Absolutely. one way or another. It's cool. So what uh, these days like. I mean, was it 10 plus years now that the band's been together? Yeah. I mean, technically I started in, in like 2005, but we've only been really like touring and putting out albums since like 09. Yeah. So yeah, about so 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, about 10 and years. And you've done, I mean, like you've done it all now. I mean, you've, done, you've hit all, most of the continents and been mm-hmm. every, most of the places and uh, lots of records now. Yeah. Uh, quite a few. And with a lot of little side project stuff and, mm-hmm. uh, and you've done a little bit of production too for other people. Yeah, it's something I, I did more of in the past, and kind of I don't know the the joy stopped there, so I stopped it. You sure, know? it did not spark joy anymore. That that reference is about four months too old. By <laughs> spark the <way>. joy. <laughs> it's it might even yeah it might even be older than that. <laughs> it might point. be older than that. <laughs> but uh, well, let's let's go ahead and use some old terminologies. What sparks joy? What like how do you keep the joy alive? Uh, at this point, like not only just like uh, music wise, but like what keeps your your spirits high and 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 uh, creative like these days? Yeah, it, it that's an interesting uh, question with a pretty complicated answer. Sure. Um, I, I've talked about this sometimes with with clinics, like I, you know, like being being effectively self employed creates a completely different dynamic than what the world prepares you for and for what your entire life prepares you for. And there are really cool things about it, working for yourself, working from home that, that are obvious. And then there's a lot of downsides or things that you need to be aware of that are not obvious at all. And then, you know, that's compounded with the fact that the music industry is its own beast and is kind of brutal in a way. Um, and it's a machine and I'm going to try and like keep this shorter, but basically you get sucked into this machine because of passion, right? So mm-hmm. you, you know, I started out just making music on my computer, making it for fun for what I would call very pure reasons. It wasn't for anything other than like, it was amazing to me that I could even do this before that. You'd have to go to a studio. You had to rely on other people and now you could just do it yourself. Like that's incredible. The world is now open to me, you mm-hmm. know? And and I'm figuring it out. And that was my that was my uh, impetus for just making music at all. It's because I can, right? So I, I consider that a very pure exploit. And I really enjoyed that time. And I enjoyed what I was creating, whether it was good or not, because it was just creating just to create, right? Sure. 
And then you eventually get sucked into the machine. You're in a band. Now you have to create. Now you have to tour. And now you're starting to do a lot of stuff that you might not do or might not want to do. And I, a lot of people will want to throw the word like selling out. out. <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure that's debatable, but it's just, it's one of those things where it's a, it's a sliding scale. It's not, it's not on or off, but you're going to take tours that maybe you didn't want to do or, you know, work on schedules that aren't necessarily the best for you or the best for the songs or the album, but because you're in this machine and you have to put out an album, there's people who work for you. You have a whole team now that you work for and that rely on you and expect you to do certain things, right? And this happens very gradually, right? So this thing that was a pure passion is now becoming a job. And jobs, as we know, ruin a lot of hobbies, right? Mm -hmm. So... So this is this is what happens and then you're you're trying to manage your time and most musicians especially ones who can sort of break into the music industry are hustlers. So it's very hard to say no to things. And you'll take on whatever work you can. Why? Cuz you got to survive. But eventually if you're lucky, it gets to the point where you can say no. But you still don't, aren't good at saying no. And I still struggle with this, you know, because there's a part of me that's like, dude, that's money on the table. You know, you need it. Mm. But then you actually have a conversation like, no, you don't. And you're trading stress for this. Mm -hmm. And you have a year that is just insanely stressful, followed by another year that's insanely stressful. And you realize that that's your trade off for money. It's not just time. It's stress. Mm -hmm. And that stress is taking years off your life. And you have to kind of learn to say no to that stuff and manage your time and be responsible about responsible about it in a way especially like you know you're getting older too so I, I feel like i had infinite energy in my 20s but now i'm 35 <laughs> and it's like i have to i have to manage everything i have to manage stress because that's that's the stuff that really kills you right mm -hmm. and that's not worth a little bit of money so i say i say no to a lot of stuff now good and i and and it's stuff that's it's taken me a very long time to come to terms with it. i'm still not okay with it but i try to keep eye on the bigger picture here that it's like yes have a little bit more money in my account and at what cost is that stress really worth it? Is it worth, you know, losing a, a year off your life for that? I don't know. Hmm. Um, so I try to, it's a balancing act, but again, no one prepares you for this. No one tells you that this is what the music industry is like. And of course you can't really have this conversation with a lot of people because they, they'd like to focus on the good and they're like, Oh, you're so lucky. You get to work for yourself. What do you have to complain about? It's like, well, no, it's just like anything else. It's when it's a job and there's a dynamic to it and there's good and bad. Mm. It should be okay to talk about the bad, but not a lot of people can relate to that. Right. So uh, you find people that can relate to it and you talk to them about it. I know that you understand what I'm talking about. Totally. But I know that there's a lot of people who are probably like, oh, shut up. You know, you don't work very hard. Like, you know, you don't need, I work really hard. You don't know what real work is like, you know, and if, if that's how they feel, it's very tough to have a conversation about that or even want to bring it up. Yeah, I totally, I totally identify. I mean, it's, it's easy for, from the outside looking in, uh, for, for years and years, most of my career doing uh, artist relations and product development and whatnot as people look like, Oh, you get to work with Misha Mansour. You get to like hang out with these people. Like, that's so great. I'm like, dude, I spend so many hours like with brain melting emails and phone calls that are super unpleasant and dealing with coworkers that don't see eye to eye with you and are obstructing this project and that project and delaying this thing. You don't see any of that stuff. I don't share that stuff with you because I don't want to share that stuff with you. Yeah. Like that's, that's for me to, that's part of the job. That's the work, you know, that's on the backside. And for you, uh, I'm sure there's uh, all the equivalent, oh, yeah. you know, uh, of all the things. And, and, um, Yes, are are we fortunate? Are we lucky that we have land, that we've you know endured a lot of that and made it to the place that we're at? Totally, yeah, hundred percent. But it's still work. It's still yeah. a lot of work. And that's the thing is like is like I'm not complaining. Sure. If I if I was unhappy, I I am pretty good at doing the things I want to do. If I was unhappy, I wouldn't be doing this. Same. But but it doesn't mean that it isn't work. It doesn't mean that there aren't like very serious downsides that shouldn't. This is more like a, a, a cautionary word to people who are getting into this. Is like, just look out for this stuff mm. because maybe you will address it sooner than I did and better than I did. You know, uh, it's very easy, I think, when you do a job that you love and something you're passionate about to overwork yourself. Mm. You know, if you, if you have a nine to five, first of all, you have a schedule that kind of prevents that from happening. You have a weekend. You have things that will prevent you from as long as like you don't take your work home you'll it's kind of designed to allow you to separate those two lives i'm always on call 
you yeah. know and you you would be too Same. you yeah it's All like it's, it's like yes there's technically hours you work there's definitely not hours i work i'm on i'm just on call that's just a reality of my life so that that's that nine to five system actually protects you from this a little bit um and uh, you know, you you have vacations, and you have you have all this stuff that's kind of regimented. Does a lot of that work and time management for you, which I don't think anything in our life really prepares us for that for time management. So yeah. you have to figure that out, and it's different for everyone. And I'm still figuring it out for myself and figuring out exactly what's right for me. But um, but that's one of those things that completely gets overlooked. And yeah, um, some people, uh, I I recognize that that that. Maybe the main, the two general groups are people, because uh, some people do need uh, that structure and need to be kind of basically told what to do, when to show up, and when to go home and do the thing. Otherwise, they won't be able to manage it themselves. So they don't go into business for themselves. They don't work. Some some people are tr- trying to figure out how to j- make the jump to go and, and work for themselves, be you know independent in some way or shape or form. But it looks and feels a lot different than what you think. Right. Like, you know, because I've been, I've been kind of running the line between the two for a long time, even though I'm associated with some brands and whatnot now and have, have these different consultant gigs. I'm now in this weird independent phase where I'm really starting to see, okay, I have to make my hours. I have to hustle. I have to get up. I have to have like motivations. I have to have these goals. I have to have my whiteboard populated so that I know what it is I'm doing when I get up. Yep. Otherwise, you know, guitar and weed and puppies are awesome, man. Like, yeah. I'll just kick it, you know? like and- Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I'll, I'll give a very good example of, of how... I, I feel like the people who are ambitious enough to chase that are also ambitious enough to overwork themselves. So I'd, mm. I actually would argue that you'd be more likely to overwork yourself, but in unhealthy amounts of time. So yes, you play right. around, you procrastinate. Then when it comes to crunch time, you'd crunch and then you would like destroy yourself. Right. Uh, So like, for example, um, we kind of did that with the albums, you know, when when we were doing Periphery 1 and Periphery 2. It was just like we'd be working 16 hour days and like I would do that with pride, you know, like Nolly and I would be like really, uh, really putting a lot of work in on like Periphery 2, you know, Um, sometimes like uh, uh, Taylor, who was producing that album, just didn't show up. And we were like, well, we got to get work done. So we literally are just working the whole time, just getting stuff done, right? And figuring mm. out how to use Pro Tools and, and whatever. And um, and so, like, like, that feels really good, except that, like, a week or two into that, you're like, I feel like death every day. I can't get enough sleep. Mm. I'd never feel good. I'm cranky. Everyone's cranky. Mm-hmm. So after that, we started implementing a rule which was suggested by Nolly, which was one of the best rules ever, hmm. especially when it comes, I'd say this works less well with the creative side, the create creative side. We kind of just let, we go with the flow. We've learned to not force that because you don't know exactly when the creative the juices are going to flow and you mm-hmm. just kind of trust that. Sure. But when it comes to regimented stuff like tracking, we do eight hour days, we start at 11 end at seven, you know, or maybe end at eight and take a break. But we have, we have hours and we stop. We respect it. doesn't matter that like, oh, we've only got a riff or two left in this song. We're going to do that tomorrow. Mm. Really, really stick to that. And man, it makes those sessions so much more livable, right? I bet. So, so, so there, you know, having the regimented schedule is a bit of a gift. I, I, my life isn't such that I can really have that, but like we do have certain things like we have weekly meetings and we have certain things that give me some sense of a routine a little bit and the rest you kind of have to build for yourself a little bit of structure uh based on the group uh and then uh a certain amount of just like agreed upon boundaries that like when you do this we're gonna approach it this way so that there's uh so everybody gets sleep yep you know yep well that was the main thing with it with the eight hour days like you know that way we're not going till 3 a.m. and then completely fucking up the schedule the next day or whatever, right? So we would actually stick to that, you know, and you have to show up on time and you know, and everyone stuck to it and made it a lot smoother. And that's something that we've gotten better about as well, you know, just kind of sticking to a schedule and not allowing ourselves to overwork ourselves because that is what happens and that's what gets you burnt out. So is this? would you say that the structure and the way that you've kind of evolved your work ethic is the thing that sparks joy for you now, creatively? Cre- creatively, or no? I, how would you say? I that- would say that it, it it stops that from ruining the joy, you know. Okay. For me, just getting depressed and wanting to quit everything, and then the just just 
writing and just doing my thing in general, you know, like, like the businesses are really fun. Uh, doing doing sure. both get good drums and uh, and horizon devices is just those both started out as passion projects those are both just things that you know i really care about and, and the guys i work with really care about and again there's this like insane level of trust i really love the people that i work with it's so important i don't think you could have a successful business a sustainable successful business if that wasn't the case um and uh and so that's a lot of fun and it's challenging and it's like kind of a lot of work in like small uh bursts but it's really it's really just satisfying and then um the music the music is just when i feel like it and and it's a very pure thing again i think one of the biggest gifts uh that i got from being able you know i always talk about how it's difficult to make a living making music Mm -hmm. but now it's at the point that thanks to the businesses and the signature products and all the ancillary income that's now all kind of become my main income so the band's income is kind of irrelevant now and the band can just be this pure exploit Mm. where it's kind of it feels like periphery four especially felt like the first time that i was writing a little bit it was just like we're just gonna write we're just gonna do Whatever we want, we're not going to worry about sales. We're not going to worry about anything, you know. I mean, let's just write. I think we were very close to that on Periphery Three, but again, it's just refining that um, with Periphery Four. That's where you know, like money just never came into the equation, and it was a really beautiful thing. So, ironically, I think music has become my hobby again. <laughs> you know, um, it's mm. not how I make my at least Periphery is not how I make my my living, and I think that's one of the best things that could have happened to it. That's awesome, yeah, because that one of the things that I like what you were outlining earlier is that when you in in the in the the beginning of all these type of bands and and like great uh musical exploits that happen that hit the world ninety nine percent percent of the time it's for the love of it scenario where yeah. you start off because man, it's so much fun, I get it the music is its own reward because when exactly. as I make it. Like I just go back and listen to it. I'm like, dude, that's me. That's my boys. That's like we're doing the thing. And that, what's better than that? Like I, oh, I know. We'll go play it live. Like that's the only thing better than that. And then, uh, but then as soon as it becomes the business, as soon as there's a contract in place and somebody expects something from you, like like they say, the classic uh, statement is that you have your whole life to make your first record. Yeah. And then you have like a, a year or two to make your second exactly. one, right? You know, and you have to like follow up and. Uh, and, and and all these expectations, and so the the love of it is is kind of slowly you know squeezed out of it through the touring, through the demands, and through the hustle, and like oh well, what is you know the other bands that are in your category are charting like this, and like are you guys gonna match that? Are you gonna hit? Are you gonna do blah, blah, all these things? Now you're kind of able to take like a, a breath. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like um, at the end of the album cycle for Periphery Three. I was pretty much ready to quit touring. I was mm. I was burnt out. I was just over it and there was a lot there there was just a lot that was bumming me out about everything. And I was in a pretty bad place mentally as well. Um and I kind of told that to the band. I, I was basically like, "Hey guys, I think maybe you guys should look at getting a uh, a live fill-in for me." You know, it's like I still want to write. I still want to be in the band and write, but I don't know if I can do this touring thing anymore. Mm. Like I don't know that I'm getting anything. You know, we were playing Shows sometimes like sold out crowds. Kids are kids are loving it, and I'm feeling nothing. I'm getting absolutely nothing. I'm like, there's mm. something wrong. And my band, this is again, this is why I feel lucky to have them as my support group. You know, they weren't, they were just there for me. They were like, they're the reason I made it through those tours. You know, they were there for me, and they just said all the right things. And they were like, look, like if this is how you feel, then we need to have a much deeper conversation. Like, what do we do to? address it you know like the fill-in is just the patch how do we fix this and they're like maybe we need to take some time off and that's what we did mm. this is why we took kind of uh a year off or, or a little more and it and then also we were able to because we started our own label three dot recordings and because we put that out uh put periphery four out on that and because we have a manager who is just the best this guy this guy uh Wayne Pagini, like he's just he's the he's the best. We can't do the band without him. Like mm. like love this guy to death, and he's got our back through everything. And he understands us. He genuinely genuinely understands us, which is honestly a bit rare in this industry. Totally. I'm so grateful that we have him. Um, so between everyone, we're we're just like, well, we need to just, you know, as you said, like 
their expectations and you need the chart and you know, and it's just like, no, do what he was saying this. And we were saying this, like, we just need to do whatever we, we need to do to make the music we want. Um, I don't even care about the music after we make it. I really like the process. You know, I don't like, <laughs> I listen to the album maybe like once or twice after we put it out. And then I just don't listen to it again. You know, mm-hmm. the only time I'll listen to it after that is if like we're practicing or if I need to relearn something, sure. but like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the actual process of making it. That makes me really happy. That's the, that's where I get the real joy from, you know? Mm. Um, and, uh, the one thing we'd never had the luxury of doing because we're in this machine and on this schedule and have to do this by that. So we can do this festival and do, you know, it was like, uh, we never were able to just take a year. Right. Mm. So that's what we did with periphery four. And it was one of the best things we could have done because, you know, when you're on the schedule, you write together and everyone's happy. But remember what I said earlier about taking a step back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you take a step back. So there's stuff like on other albums where I'm like, okay, that's good. But now that I'm a bit removed from it, like we could have done that better. I wish we had done this or that. Periphery four is the album where I feel like we got the closest because we had a few, we didn't actually spend a year writing it, but we did a few sessions where we were able to take a month or two away then come back and be like, okay, okay, how do we feel about this? And some songs went through drastic changes. Mm. You know, there's there like, it's only smiles like on its first and maybe even second draft. I was like, I don't like this song and we need to cut this from the album. Like I really wow. feel strongly about this being a very weak song. And it was just arrangement stuff. It was like, but it's amazing how these small changes can, can make a huge difference. And it went from being that to like one of my favorite songs on the album, but we allowed it to have the time that it needed, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'd say as a result, it was the album that, collectively everyone individually was also happy on a or collectively but on an individual level everyone was happiest with you know normally this compromise some level of comp- compromise is going to happen when you've got five people making an album right but sure. i think everyone was at their happiest uh with periphery four because we took the time to address everything several times and that was something that you know under a traditional label structure and with some managers they just wouldn't allow that to happen or they give you a lot of stress even if you're allowed to do what you want to do like we are to not have people breathing down your neck constantly if we're the label we just decide and our manager's like yep whoever's gonna help you make a good album i don't care Mm. set a deadline and then you know if you need to break it hopefully you don't break it but if you need to break it and it makes the album better break it you know he's just got a very pure approach to it and he respects the music and he knows that that's the most important that's the most sacred thing for us so um, that experience brings me brings me joy. That sparks joy right there. Because that was like the way that we were able to hack this system and be in the music industry, but not be a slave to it. Not be a slave to that machine that just wants to like, you know, chew you up and, and spit you out. And P4 is the first record off of 3 Dot? Yep. Or it's our... Um, yeah, I guess it is the first 3 Dot record. Or did we put out... We might have put out uh, four seconds ago. Uh, my uh, electronic side project with Jake. Okay. Might have put that out. Yeah, I think we put that out first. That was kind of our uh, litmus test to see if we could put out records, you know? Sure, sure. Uh, and it was actually kind of good that we did that because we were able to refine a few things. But I will say that now that we have our team on board, you know, the the one thing is that, like, we are our own producers and we have a very, very specific vision for the band. So it's best for us to have control over everything. Totally. If you don't have a specific vision, then it's great to get producers. It's great to get all these people that handle everything else for you or give you advice on stuff. But we know exactly what we want. So basically assuming control of just about every aspect allowed us to have one of the tightest releases and just everything was like clockwork because everyone mm-hmm. on our team is like us. Where it's just attention to detail. It was just oh, it was just the best feeling to just get everything done and have a plan for everything. And it got released exactly the way that we wanted. Got to feel really good. That was that was really really satisfying on that end, and kind of kind of showed us that like uh, doing the whole three dot thing and and our own label was the right move for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, funny enough, the album charted really well too, <laughs> which is just bonus. It's just icing on the cake. If, even if it hadn't, like it just everything else felt so good that we were like, this is the right way. But then that just sort of confirmed all sides. Like, yes, this was the right move. Yeah. Yeah, that that you you followed your intuition, followed your heart, followed the way that made things e- more easeful for everybody, mm-hmm. and then when everybody gets more relaxed and creative, and then like the best 
record comes out of it and it was the easiest record to make yeah it was the least cool. stressful it felt like it just happened so it opens with a with a 15 16 minute long song called reptile that's the first thing we wrote Jeez. and 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 it was just we were just itching to write we were just itching to write mark came uh with like some riffs and this new tuning you know uh and we, we were just like oh no this song's not done the song's not done we got done, you know, like demoing out the the arrangement, you know, and even the initial arrangement is pretty close to what the final one was. Um, and we showed uh, Spencer and Matt kind of expecting them to shut it down. But they were like, no, this is this is great. You know, we can work with this. Um, but yeah, we were just we were just ready to go, man. And it's... like the, the, the vibe and everything was just like very, just very open. I don't know. It was just that 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 feeling is something I chase. That is yeah. what I'd like. And I'd like every album to feel like that. Sure. Well, you're you've got a um you've got a, a an example of it now. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of like find how to apply the sim a similar process to your other projects. We and we we have like Haunted Shores, same thing. We, you know, you know what the, the 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 way we do it is I'll tell Mark or Jake to come over. Mm. Come over and let's hang out. And if we write one song, great. If we write zero songs, great. At least we got to hang out. Let's just hang out, play some video games, smoke some weed, you know, just have a good, just yeah. relax. I swear to God, um, uh, the four seconds ago album, which I'm really, really proud of and, and happy that, that Jake and I did together. It was just two sessions of him coming over for a week and we just smoked a lot of weed, which I don't really, I don't really smoke much weed. I only really smoke it like when I'm trying to be creative and spark other ideas, mm. but we smoked weed for like a week straight and played video games and somehow ended up with an album. I had barely, it was just such a flow. And, and that's a beautiful thing. That's like what I try to chase. And it's the exact same thing with Haunted Chores with Mark. It was like, we're just having fun hanging out and somehow songs were appearing, you know? I love that. I, and that's something I was going to remark on earlier is that uh, part of the the boon for you and and being in this band and finding your your bandmates is 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 just that. It's finding people that you've been able to establish and carry on uh, long-term relationships with which in in a world of like oh it's cool man just get a different drummer uh you know what whatever dude it's my project man i'm gonna get a different bass player and you know in, in a world that is in a lot of ways we see a lot of that right like we see it, it's it's really cool to see a band stay together um a and and have a guy like nolly that like kind of le le leaves the band but like doesn't leave the band and like yeah. still still he's such such a homie that you guys can't do without him you want him to be yeah. involved and yeah. and you guys uh you you treat each other like family you find a way to like work around each other's things and just like you're telling me how the band said well you're not feeling good man let's like work let's find a way through it and not like replace you it is like a family you know? though and yeah. i mean the nolly thing we could talk about you know i get a lot of questions about it, but it's a perfect example of what you're talking about people don't understand what happened with nolly and the truth is he came to us saying that he was unhappy on tour or he didn't even come to us we could tell you know he doesn't yeah. complain about stuff <laughs> he just he's like he's very much like stiff upper lip like you just do the work and shut up mm. and i was like man like because nolly's like a funny kind of light-hearted goofy guy uh and on tour he was just really like like keep into himself and he just looked bummed out all the time. I'm like, Hey man, you okay? He's like, you know, I just don't know if this touring things for me. And that's, that's heartbreaking. But also I can never hold that against anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I, you should never tour or do anything if it's making you sad, you know, especially not something that I think, I think he stuck with it cause he expected it to make, it. he felt probably so lucky that he got to do it at all. And then to find out that he wasn't getting what he wanted out of it, you mm -hmm. know? And then, he was trying to focus more on his family life and production. And it was just getting in the way of that. And I was like, all right, dude, you don't need a tour. You know, we're there for you. We want it, but we want you in the band. I, I love writing with him. He may not be the most prolific writer, but the stuff he does write is just incredible. So it's like, yeah, we'll, we'll take you in whatever capacity we, we could get. And he kind of assumed that we wouldn't want him to stay in the band. And we're mm. like, no, dude, like whatever, whatever we can get, we'll take. And then after a while, he was just so uninvolved with everything that he actually was like, look, I don't even think it's fair for me to be in this band anymore. <laughs> and also, you know, Periphery 3 was kind of an example of him having an obligation to the band, but he didn't like having an obligation to the band if there's something else he wanted to do, for example, go on vacation or take on another band, you know, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So he was like, look, I don't think it's fair for me to be in the band. Um, so I don't want to be in the band... But if you guys want to hire me, of course I want to do, you know, of course I want to be involved with the albums. Um, 
And of course I'll play bass and all that, but we just hire him to do that, you know? And he's like, you know, if anything, it works out better because you just pay me my fee and like you guys split it five ways instead of six ways, you know? And we're like, well, you know, if that's what you want to do. So that basically he's not, he has no obligation to the band. But if we take the time to schedule it with him and do it properly, we can. And that's what we did for Periphery 4. Mm. So that's why he is very involved with Periphery 4 because we're like, hey, you know, can you can you uh, mix our album? Um, and, uh, you know, can you engineer the drum sessions? And can you play all the bass, you know, and figure sure. out all that <laughs> stuff? You know, like... Uh, like I I wrote all the bass parts and I just sent him the audio and he figured it out by ear and t- retracted it. You know, oh, he's a, he's a beast. That's easy for you. And then that makes it really, oh, it's really the easiest easy. Thing, it's the easiest thing in the world. And then, you know, we just send Matt off to like do the, the, the drums with him, you know, and they go and get that done. Mm-hmm. Um, Nolly is a, is still one of my closest friends. And I mean, he's like him, uh, him, Matt and, and I and Dez uh, from Good Tiger are, are, are get good drums. Mm. So he's also a business partner. Yeah. So it's like we, we, we work very closely together. Um, some people are like, oh, are you guys still tight? It's like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, but that's that's basically the deal. And it was just trying to respect his wishes, trying to make it as comfortable for him and find as reasonable a solution. Because it's like we still want to work with you. And that's the next album. We're just going to do the same thing. We're going to be like, hey. We want to work with you. Does this timing work? And he'll set aside the time and he'll do the work. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, as opposed to like being like, oh, we'll just get another guy or like, fuck you or like whatever, which is the attitude that you're talking about. Right. You know, it's like maybe try to work with the people you care about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, especially when it's good. And, and uh, But that's like, it just speaks to the kind of relationships that you guys have cultivated with each other. And it speaks to uh, the individuals in the band uh, giving a fuck. Like yep. about about the the individuals and and that each person was able to say, well, it's not it's not always about me, like uh, and my wishes, and, and that you guys have shown me that through uh, the way that you worked in the re- on the records and how you've come around to, you know, evolving to this place and um, and and it obviously it worked out for you too because you had a moment of feeling that way, and the band was like, hey, let's talk it out. Yep, let's sort it out. It's been pretty consistent. Yeah, I mean, whenever anyone's you know and it's not always that big sometimes it's smaller things you know yeah but but we we talk and we 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 keep it pretty we keep it pretty tight you know like we uh we look out for each other so it's good so i i I think that is something that i've identified like above all like be in business or bands or whatever with people you like and people that you feel have your back and whose back you have as well they'll go they'll go a very long way so, so personally, I mean, so you kind of spoke to your joy sparking with the music, which is, I mean, your your personal and professional life are are intermingled pretty pretty heavily, like anybody that works from home and is an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, but like uh, a little more f- removed, maybe from the music part of it, cars. It's pretty much cars, yeah. Cars. Uh, I have fun with photography. Uh, you know, I, I dabble in that. It's just a, a fun little hobby. Um, I'm really into it's funny i used to hate sports when i was uh younger hated hated sports but you know mark always makes a point of like just going to sporting events on tour it's like one of my favorite things to do hmm. just go to like a rent we've gone to minor league baseball games i don't even know anything about it but i just like going to sporting events we'll always i love hockey so we'll always try to catch whatever hockey games we can catch um and uh and i'm obsessed with formula one which of the car thing of course yeah, you sure. know so like that those are things that sort of occupy my time and and that that i'm very passionate about um even though i don't know anything about baseball or basketball like been to a bunch of games you know and i and i i greatly enjoy it. it's like a good way to actually get your head out of touring mode mm-hmm. and exist in this other space for a few hours and just kind of i don't know it's just very it clears your mind a little bit it's very very nice um and yeah other than that like just just cars. God, I love cars so much. It's all I think about. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Did you? Were you raised with any kind of uh, spiritual thread at, at all, or do you have any like? Uh... So I was raised Jewish. Okay. And very, very strict. Uh, I think because my grandmother is doing. You know, she was she was very religious, and then um, like my my dad was religious because of her, and my mom converted to Judaism, and like basically like my whole childhood I was raised very like way too strict. I was even talking to my parents about that. I was like, you know, mm. this really was a deterrent if anything. Cause we kept super kosher, which was like, you know, separate plates for, for meat and dairy 
And like, you know, it had to have kosher branding, like the circle U sure. or circle K or whatever on it. And if it didn't, even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't an offending food group, it could have been like cereal or whatever. Right. But you couldn't <laughs> have it. Um, it kind of got worse and worse uh, as I, as I got closer to my bar mitzvah. Um, and I really disliked that. Like you couldn't eat hamburgers or pepperoni pizza cause you can't meet mix meat or dairy. So even if it wasn't like pork products or whatever, wow. Yeah, I hated that. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then when it when you have your bar mitzvah, you're a man, quote unquote. So so then I was like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> but I have my bar mitzvah to thank for the music stuff because I bought my first kit with that, and I bought like you know really cheap like guitar with it too. So that, does that happen when you're like 16 or something? 13. Oh, 13. When you're 13, yeah. Okay. You you kind of lead the prayer um, at your synagogue. Uh, I did a Thursday session and a, and a saturday one i don't remember my you, parasha though but you, do know. you feel any connection to to like the spiritual side of it no the no side? no 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 and i think i was a punk because i was always asking questions i'm a very logical person a little too logical so i was just like there's a lot about this religion that really doesn't make sense and you know rabbis are pretty good about fielding questions they like it sure um, they, they won't be like kind of just like at least the rabbi i had was really was uh really nice um, but I was just never getting satisfa- satisfactory answers. And it was just kind of like, yeah, I don't buy any of this stuff and it's all kind of irrelevant. And there's really weird archaic rules. Like I understand why like keeping kosher was important before like pasteurization. Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, in the modern world, you really do not need to keep kosher to, to be healthy <laughs> or to stay alive. So, um, you know, just take the useful tips, like wash your hands all the time. <laughs> it's funny, uh, somebody sent me uh, this little meme. It says, tradition, peer pressure from dead people. Right. That's, right? that's exactly and right. It's kind of <laughs> like what a lot of religion and like, you know, stuff is these yeah, days. Yeah, uh, I'm not, but I'm not like a, a, a spiritual person, as it were. Uh, Are you atheist? Uh, I mean, I... I, I'd sound more agnostic. I, I, I actually take pleasure in not knowing what, what's out there. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, cause atheists seem so like, Hard-aged. I know what this is. Yeah. It's almost like a religion in and of, of itself. It's like, totally. a, because the thing I dislike about religions is how absolute they are. Um, right. so, so I like something that's just like, I don't know, let's figure it out. And that seems to be what I, I guess that labels me an agnostic. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's out there. Uh, I highly doubt it's anything like what the religious, you know, or what religions suggest it is. Um, but, uh, but I also don't care if, you know, like my parents are religious, like, um, uh, if, if you're religious and it makes you happy and you're not harming anyone else, like God, do whatever makes you happy. I don't care. I'm not going to, I feel like atheists sometimes can be kind of militant. They'll be like, you know, there's no God. Right. And it's like, why are you, why are you ruining it for them? Like, I'm enjoy it. If you like someone coming to me and be like, you know, cars suck and they're stupid. I'll be like, no, I don't. I don't think they are. I like them. So cars are my religion. There's something about atheists and vegans that they share a certain thing. I right? don't know what it is. Not 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 to harsh on <laughs> vegans too hard, but because I like vegan food and I and I I've been vegan and vegetarian different times. But there's a, a certain thing about like the hard edged, like it's because they want to. I guess because they they really feel like absolute about the answer or it's a sub it's it's a subculture thing they feel they have to maybe overcompensate but actually to be fair i haven't really met any atheists or vegans who in real life have been militant like every vegan i've ever met in real life uh even though i'm not vegan at all has always been really chill about it and not brought it up or just brought it up like in the sense like, oh yeah, like I can't eat there because I'm mm. vegan or like, you know, hey, could we take that into account? But it's, it's always been chill. It's never been like this, like, oh, by the way, your you know, meat is murder, like to me or whatever. Like it's never been a judgmental kind of thing. I'm glad you haven't experienced that. Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe I think maybe the the the, the social railing against militancy around yeah. that has softened a lot of vegan vegetarian, but I know a handful of them and my brother, the first one that ever convinced me to try to be vegan uh, was an old ex bandmate, and he was just so hardcore, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I wanted to be cool. Like I was like, like I, I, I understood the ethical reasons, and I understood yeah. like I'm, I'm connected to that. I have empathy towards animals, you know. But uh, the way that he went about it, and the way it was just like you know black and white, and there was no like real room for discussion, ultimately wore me the fuck out. Well, that'll be a deterrent over yeah. anything. I mean, yeah. there's always room for discussion. There should be some daylight in a conversation. So. 
they're kind of shutting that out, then they just want to yell at you. They don't really want to yeah, have just, a discussion. I think you're just angry. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is maybe maybe that's what how he was manifesting his anger through his militant uh, veganism. But in my experience, it's been pretty chill. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't care if people are religious. Like yeah. I, yeah, as long as you're cool, like who cares, right? But um, but personally, I just haven't gotten anything from from any religion. And I, I like I like the idea that like we're kind of insignificant and that there's no real meaning to life. It lets you just figure it out for yourself. You know, it kind of gives you an open path. Like do whatever you want, do what makes you happy, you know? Yeah. Um, do what sparks joy. We're really, we're bringing this thing <laughs> like, back, man. We're, man. We really, we really are bringing this thing it's back. It's not old now. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 the, the logical uh, question in my head is to ask like, what do you think happens when we die? Nothing. Just lights out. Lights out. What, what, it's the same thing as, what happened before you were born? What was that like? I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's that. I I'm think it's sure. just, you're just, you're just, just done. Well, that's why, that's why I enjoy, enjoy it, man. Like, yeah. you know, you've got this, uh, look, maybe, maybe I'm wrong and then we'll figure it out. But like, there's no point <laughs> in planning around that. Like you might as well just make this one count. This might be your only ride. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we're in a simulation. Maybe when you die, you know. Maybe when you may, maybe when you yeah. die, like you know, you, you you're like, oh, oh, and you take the headset off, and they're like, how was it, man? Can I have a go? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? You know, it's that's, uh, that's a cool, cool. Uh, but 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 there's no point. There's no point in worrying about that. Like, sure. as far as we know, as far as we know, this is what we've got. So, and there's no real. It's it's uh it's choose your own adventure, you know. So you just kind of make the most of it and uh and do what uh, or try to do what makes you happy, right? Yeah, yeah. I like that. This is a common answer recently uh, uh from a few different uh, other pods where people I've asked and uh, they said, oh, you know, lights out. Like, uh, and this is they give their own versions of like what they think, you know, and 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 the philosophy around it. And it's I, which I totally think is valid. And um. Because I think, uh, like, uh, Fred, the other day, when he was sitting in your chair, he says, uh, you know, I think it's a really beautiful thing. Yeah. That, uh, that, that like, this is all you would get. And that, yeah. that kind of makes it more important. Makes it special. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, and even the, the you know, I'm, I'm, I, I love, uh, on, a, on a casual level, I love, like, astrophysics and ast- astronomy mm-hmm. and all that fun stuff, right? And I find it all so fascinating. I think the thing I find so fascinating is how... My my mind can't even fathom these things, you know. Sure. We only yeah. understand them by by extension, you know, because these numbers and these distances are just literally unfathomable, right? Yeah. So, so the insignificance of our sun, which to us is like the hugest thing in the world, <laughs> but it's just not even a blip on the radar of the universe, right? No. Which may also be a multiverse. So our universe may also be a blip on you know the grand the the grand scale of things like, who knows right yeah. but even as far as what we can tell we are so unbelievably insignificant and so that just makes it all that more special like we haven't been able to detect life of any kind and we have detectors that can reach pretty far out uh the 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 limits of of physics and the nature of the universe as we understand it are are such that we're kind of limited to ha- how quickly we can communicate with these large distances because we're limited to the speed of light. But, you know, I, I do think that this, this sort of setting just makes all of this that much more special. Right. Mm. Um, and, and I think maybe there was this transition of, especially if you were like kind of deeply religious, um, where, where your life had a meaning, right. Uh, and a very specific meaning, uh, to go from that to nothing, that could be very jarring, but, I don't know that I ever had that. So to me, it was always just kind of like this this blank canvas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like that. I like that a lot. That brings me a lot of comfort, actually, to just kind of know, like, no, you're not supposed to do anything. So just figure it out. Figure out what, what you want. Like, maybe life has no meaning. Yeah. Maybe it's just, maybe it just is. Maybe some things just are, maybe. Sure. You know, and, and that's that's fine. So just make it whatever you want. Maybe because it sounds like you had a minimal amount of trauma. Maybe you know in in your early years, like your family is pretty decent, other than being a little strict around the religious stuff. Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go. So, no? Oh, I've got. I've no? got a you multitude got, of complexes. You got yeah. a lot of trauma. Oh, I mean, like uh. it's just just mental. You know, it's all sorts. Of, I I love my family, but God, we're a mess. Yeah, dysfunctional, okay. dysfunctional family. Oh, okay. They're, oh, yeah, it's a so mess up like, here. You're like the rest of oh, us. Oh, just like the rest of you. No, <laughs> even worse. No, I'm, I definitely need to go back to therapy and all that fun stuff, without oh, a doubt. 
Well, ther- therapy has done wonders for me. Uh, me too. Years. I have me to, too. I have to praise it more than I would hate on it. I think of I've it as like a brain it. massage. It's like one of those things. I think my, my mistake is that I've been going there only when things are dire and I should have just been going just like to get a checkup, you know, or like, it's yeah. like, it's like changing your, your oil or whatever. Yeah. You know, you just got to maintain, you got to make, it's a good way to maintain your brain. And I'm, I have not always been the best at maintaining it. So no, I'm a big, big fan of, of therapy. If it's uh, with a good therapist, and if it's done well yeah, and with good intention, but, um, but yeah, no, it's a mess. It's a mess up there. I'm a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I am, I'm literally a disaster of a human being, but I'm, I'm doing my best to try to keep it together. You're holding it together. Yeah. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm, I'm keeping, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting an illusion, which is very convincing, but you know, oh, I think that's what we're all, you know, on some level doing, we're doing our best to present what, what we'd, what we'd like to be. You yeah. Know? Like, and, 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 and we're, it's that goal. It's like having a, it's, it, always having an ever present goal of like, Hey, you know, I want to be a reasonable person in the world inside. I feel like a hot mess and I want to fucking throw shit every once in a while and be, and throw a fit about the things that I didn't get that I wanted, you yeah. know? Uh, and, but, but you know better than those things, you know, and like and therapy helps you understand. Well, even you know on better. the, even on the other side, you know, it's like, I've gotten the things I've wanted mm. and now I just have these massive, uh, complexes about like imposter syndrome. Like oh. I don't belong here. I don't deserve any of this. Any one of these days, someone's going to figure out that I'm a fraud mm. and that I don't deserve any of this. And it's all going to be gone because yeah, I do not feel like I belong. I, I, I feel like, None of this should have happened. <laughs> you know, it seems to be uh, rampant, especially in the in this community. I would say, like musicians, artists, creatives, people that um, make their living based on their own their own creativity, their own output. Yeah, uh, but they're not just a work for hire. Yeah, like uh, it's it's easier even in work for hire situations, it can get to that point. Yeah. But I, but I know it seems to be rampant. And imposter syndrome is uh, uh, a fairly new term yeah. like in in our lexicon uh and but it but i've it's heard so it so accurate it's exactly how i feel Same. like i think what it is it's a combination of me being competitive and me appreciating other talent and also me not thinking that anything i do is that special like i write music cuz i enjoy it cuz it sparks joy as we've been saying yeah, yeah. not because i think i'm particularly good at it and i don't understand why people think i'm good at it you know enough to come to shows and pay money to see my band <laughs> play like that doesn't make sense to me but i'm accepting it but i know that one of these days they're going to be like wait he sucks why are we doing it <laughs> you know and 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 i see all these musicians that i really admire and i'm like that's that's a real musician that's what a real musician i'm mm. not a real musician mm. that's a real musician so it's kind of those two things and it's like man what am i doing here like the why am I in the same room as like real mm. musicians? These guys have their shit together and I'm a mess. Self-worth. Yeah. Yeah. I got a, the, you see complexes from yeah, childhood. Yeah, no, oh, no. that's, that's a big one. Same. Yeah. We're not going to go too deep into that because I don't want to cry on your podcast. That's okay, but, no, you know, it's all, all, things, all, all <laughs> things considered here. It's not NPR, but <laughs> well, that's, it's, it's a valuable uh, insight to, to hear that about your struggle. And I think about any, any other humans that can hear, uh, two guys talk uh, openly about like, uh, I, you know, we have some success in the world and um, doing things that a lot of people would love to be doing, um, but, but they currently don't know where they're, how, how to do or get into s- something like this. Yeah. Um, to hear that the struggle like internally is not just, uh, just, oh, no, it's fine. Everything's good. Yeah. You know, like I, I, th- there's that struggle too on top of the workload. Like you're also like everybody is dealing with some aspect of childhood trauma mostly I've, I've met a few people that are like ah, my my parents were perfect and that's what i was going down the road with you and you're like no no not, no no, not, no not i, I love them to death but yeah no <laughs> no <laughs> yeah same my parents are great i love them to death too um i will i will lift my mom up forever she worked so hard to like support yeah. me and get get me out in the world but um you know it doesn't come without they uh, didn't know any better man <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> They were doing the best they can with what they got. My sister, my sister's got uh, two kids. She's got a niece and a nephew, and her and and uh, my brother in law, who I love to death, like they. I, oh, I probably shouldn't say this, but they were they are like a thousand times better parents, or at least it seems to be. We'll see how the kids come out <laughs> for it. Yeah, but yeah. like you know, because because I, I have a brother and sister, and like I think we're all we're all like doing like pretty well for ourselves or whatever you know we're all like my my brother's a sweetheart of a human being he's one of the sweetest kids you'll ever meet and my sister is very successful and you know we had a we had a rough time growing up but like we get along great now 
but like her and my brother-in-law are like <laughs> so much better parents than like my parents and and i'm just like oh i wonder what that would have been like <laughs> Sure. Like, and the, the kids get along. Like, I used to fight like crazy with my brother and sister when I was growing up. In hindsight, I'm realizing I was kind of mirroring my parents' behavior because they mm. would fight a lot and whatever. Mm. Uh, but I see how my uh, how my my niece and nephew get along. You know, and they're kids, so they still get into dumb stuff. But like, they really, really love each other and get along. They they just absolutely adore each other. I'm like, wow, I didn't I didn't know that you could do that, you know? Yeah. I didn't know it could be like that. So I think that now there's a lot more awareness of mental health and about the effects of, and, and psychology. It's not just like kind of snake oil and pseudoscience now. Now there's actually some some belief in this stuff and that, that it affects, you know, kids from a young age and like that their environment, their their nurture also affects them as much as their nature. And it, it, it's all stuff that needs to be addressed. So... Yeah, I, I, I see that, you know. Well, you, ho- you, ho- you hope that the next generation parents better. I hope so. You hope that they learn something and they go, okay, these things were done for me and I, I'm going to change that. I'm going to do one better or evolve it or shift it in the direction for my kids so that they have uh, a better chance at doing whatever it is that they're yeah, meant to Yeah, yeah. I, I think, and I think there's also a balance to that because, you know, some kids have got it really good, you know, and... and we could get into all sorts of weird topics, which we probably shouldn't get into because we don't don't want to lose your entire audience. But like, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just it's it's interesting. I just I'm I'm interested to see what happens. But yeah, I think at any point, including my parents, everyone was just doing their best. My parents were doing the best that they could. They didn't they didn't know any better. And like, I'm not gonna make it seem like they were horrible to me because they weren't. But they just you know, there's a lot of stupid stuff in the way that they handled things that weren't right that created, you know complexes or <laughs> whatever yeah which I, I i deal with to this day and it's fine i still absolutely love my parents to death so you know they didn't mess up that bad sure <laughs> yeah yeah no that's good well uh outside of uh the family unit well i want to shift towards uh music appreciation mm-hmm. and ask you what have you been appreciating lately uh and, and maybe extra points if you got anything that like not, not a lot of people maybe know about like yeah i mean or i think players. one of the one of the things that maybe we were talking about this a little bit earlier is like how you don't listen to heavy music so much i it's i don't selective. Really, it's i don't selective. yeah it, it takes a, it takes a really special band for me to listen to heavy music like love the new car bomb like, mm. but it takes that they rule. It takes that, you know, yeah. it takes like something or like, I don't even know what style of music this is anymore. Um, so, um, you know, I've been listening to the new car bomb, obviously, but other than that, that's probably the only heavy thing I've been listening to. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't listen to a lot of music. I've always been bad about listening to music. Um, uh, I just prefer silence or podcasts most of the time. Whoa. So yeah, it's just, it's weird. Uh, like, I, I there there is a band that that I absolutely love. Um I have to thank Peter Witchers over at Jackson for for turning me on to this band completely by accident. I was just playing in his car, but Hammock, oh my god. Hammock, Hammock dude, you need to check this out. Yeah? You will love it. Oh okay. my god, it's just the most beautiful ear candy music. That's what I listen to. It's Hammock. All right. And I've been listening to a lot of like EDM lately just cuz I'm trying to get more into that stuff for myself. Um I think Dead Mouse is awesome. Dead Mouse. I think I think uh, John Hopkins is awesome. Mm. Um, who am I listening to? Uh, God, who am I listening to? Oh yeah, Sorrow is really good. Uh, honestly, Jake's Jake has this electronic playlist. He's the he listens to a ton of music. Okay. He curates these these playlists, and I just listen to them. Like this is all really sick, and I need to be better. Oh, Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill is just, oh, dude. Mr. Like, Bill. Mr. Bill is like the, he's figured out how to make electronic music groove. Hmm. Yeah, oh my God, Mr. Bill is the best. Okay. Um, yeah, so like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, of artists. There's, a, there's another guy I've been checking out lately. Uh, I don't know, if, is it AU5? I don't know how you say it. Hey, but whatever, AU5. That guy is really, really sick too. Incredible sound design. Um, so, a lot of this stuff is like kind of me mis- listening to it because it's a it's a genre of music I'm just trying to learn about, mm-hmm. you know. And and the sound design aspect is something I'm not good with, but I want to get better at. So I listen to a lot of guys I think are very strong with sound design, but obviously I have a great ear for melody and music and arrangement and all that. Um, and other than that, and like hammock, I don't really listen to 
music. That's <laughs> good. No, those are all really good uh, jump off points. Mm-hmm. And I make a I make a, a a custom curated playlist for every episode. Oh, okay. So yeah. it'll have periphery in here, and then I'll put all those bands. In sure, there as well. sure. That's great. That's great. Just uh, so it's easy reference point for the listeners to like jump off to Spotify playlist. Yeah. It's already made. Uh, so like, if you're listening. Then go check out the podcast playlist. Yeah, check that out. Check out some some really really sick music. Yeah, thanks a lot for being here and doing this for with me. Of course, Michelle. man. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm 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 actually glad. Like I didn't know that you had a podcast, and I think it's a great idea. Cool. I'm glad that you're doing this, man. Players pick podcast picks and perspective with Chris Johnson. This episode of Players Pick Podcast brought to you by our good friends at Jim Dunlop Guitar Products, Kiesel Custom Guitars, and Mackie Headphones and Mixers. Sound design by Drew the Drew, and voiceovers by the amazing Minnie Joe. I've been your host, Chris Johnson. Until next time. <laughs>